Hello, and welcome to our webcast. I'm Jamie Pennington with Moss Adams, and I'm getting us started for today's session, Navigate Medicaid Eligibility Redeterminations. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome, and thanks for joining. We're pleased to present our continuing professional education webcast series. Before we begin, please keep the following in mind. You can customize how you view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top right of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons that relate to a different aspect of our session. You can download a PDF of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget. You can ask questions by typing in the Q&A window and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session offers one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy requirements. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of polling questions. To participate in the polls, please check the button next to your answer within the slide window and click Submit. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE Progress widget and download your CPE certificate. Don't worry if you can't download your CPE certificate today. We'll email you a copy in two weeks. If attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our Group CPE Attendance Sheet, available in our slide deck and handouts widget, to receive credit. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. CPE credit can only be awarded to participants registered as themselves and isn't available for participants who view the on-demand version. This presentation is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. And now I would like to introduce today's presenters. Eric Lucas, Managing Director within the Moth Adams mm -hmm. Provider Reimbursement Practice, Richard Ryder, Director within the Moth Adams Revenue Cycle Practice, Carrie Conley, General Counsel and Executive Vice President with the Georgia Hospital Association, and John Moore, CFO and Senior Vice President of South Georgia Medical Center. Their bios and contact information are located in your webcast console for your convenience. And now I would like to turn the floor over to Eric to get the presentation started. Eric? Thank you. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today on a topic that's been getting lots of attention uh, over the past several months. Uh, there's probably not a week that's gone by where we haven't fielded questions or requests on the topic of Medicaid redeterminations. And it's with that in mind that we've put together this roundtable discussion to, to kick it around a bit and uh, share thoughts, concerns, uh, and best practices as we move forward through there. I'm pleased to be joined by Richard, uh, Carrie, and John. Thank you all for, for coming today. I am going to uh, provide a, oops, sorry. I am gonna provide a uh, quick background uh, on the topic. Um, what is Medicaid redetermination? Uh, and then we're gonna move to the discussion aspect of this uh, time together today. Uh, I'd like to break that up into a couple different sections here. What concerns are we having about this overall process? How it's overall going mm -hmm. um, from the different perspectives of the people on the call today? The impacts that we're, we're currently seeing or expecting to see, and then what can be done ultimately about this? If we have time uh, at the end, we'll, we'll field some questions. Uh, if we do not have time though, uh, I would encourage you to continue to, to add uh, your questions to the Q&A and we'll address after the discussion today. So, how did we get here? So let's set the stage. 
Uh, as the public health emergency was declared, federal and state governments took a number of steps to help healthcare providers address the challenging landscape. Legislation was passed and provided additional funding and loosened regulations. CMS and HRSA provided waivers and changed processes to lower burden on providers. Um, there was one clear goal here with all this, and that was to provide maximum flexibility to ensure providers could meet this unprecedented challenge. Uh, equally important, provider payment provisions ensure that, that the care for the vulnerable populations did not um, go down and, and stayed focused. Uh, earlier this year, that public health emergency uh, ended. And while these legislative and, and regulatory changes didn't necessarily end overnight, the process on many of them has begun to uh, uh, discontinue these processes. Here's a few examples of uh, several different changes that we saw over the last couple of years, but we're really going to be focusing on that last one, and that's in the Medicaid uh, enrollment uh, issue. Uh, so the question is being asked repeatedly of providers, uh, how will the end of these policies impact revenue streams and pay Um The end of Medicare sequestration or COVID uh, add-on was easily determined um, by providers, but this, this particular issue seems a little bit more uh, difficult to really grasp. What does it mean? How is it ultimately going to impact uh, the different um, uh, providers. So let's let's go through that a little bit here. So let's talk about how we got here in the first place. We have um, the passing of the Families First Corona uh, Virus Act. Uh, it eased the burden on states, ensuring continuous coverage for vulnerable populations. Uh, provided enhanced matching payments to states. Uh, through the FMAP while requiring states to keep Medicaid recipients continuously enrolled. Uh, originally, that was scheduled to end with the expiration of the public health emergency, but more recent legislation revised that, providing a, a different transition period. And through that, we saw dramatic changes to Medicaid enrollments. The result, 25% enrollment growth to 22.2 million enrollees. That's over a baseline of 3.5 million. So in 2019, we had 88 million enrollees that grew to 110 million by the end of the public health emergency. Just a dramatic increase. And while states estimated the additional cost of this burden at 47 billion, the enhanced payments that they received through this process were actually close to double that. But I should point out that's that's in the aggregate. Every state is different with its Medicaid programs, and they all were in different positions as, it, as um, this was carried through. So what does redetermination look like? So the first thing we need to point out is the federal matching payments reduced uh, over a transition period. So the funding for uh, uh, the enrollment is going down encouraging states to address the issue as quickly as they can. Um, as funding decreased, states work to address the enrollment issues with different sets of tools. Each state is different, and so it's important to recognize that we have uh, different problems as we talk about this issue uh, in each of the uh, different states. The payment implications from a Medicare or Medicaid implication are, are, are fairly obvious, but I'll, I want to talk about them real quickly. The, the first one and the more obvious one is if Medicaid enrollment is going to go down, we're going to see a shift in payer mix. We're going to see patients coming out of Medicaid and going into other coverage or potentially non-coverage situations. Uh, and this is a, a signif significant amount of enrollees moving all at once. Um, the uh, Medicare implication is we're going to see a, a drop in DISH. DISH, uh, traditional DISH and uncompensated care DISH both rely on uh, Medicaid uh, as the proxy for the calculation, uh, and those will uh, most obviously go down. Uh, as DISH declines, we'll also see reduction in um, providers that are qualifying for 340B. Uh, so especially those that have qualified under uh, the, the DISH threshold. 
Uh, there, there's other implications here. The first would be Medicaid supplemental funds. Um, so Medicare and Medicaid certainly uh, will have uh, payment implications that relates to this. And I, I'll start, Rich, is there any other implications here that we should be thinking about as we as we start this discussion on um, what redetermination might mean to the process or the or providers? Yeah, one other thing um, you know that I would mention is thinking about the payer mix shifts. Um, you know, a lot of the focus has been on shift to uninsured and exchange, uh, which is definitely going to happen. But a lot of in a lot of these cases, we might also have some of these beneficiaries who are eligible for employer-based programs as well. And so that's something, you know, thinking about it kind of from a rev cycle perspective, we want to make sure we've got the mechanisms in place to get folks into those programs where that's possible. Yep. Um, and just to kind of set the stage, um, John, as you hear about the, the issue of Medicaid redeterminations, is there anything specifically that you're concerned with for your hospital? Uh, and, and when did you start thinking about this topic? Good. First, thank you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the concern on on my part, you, you know, is that you know potential loss of a payer source for for one of our patients. Uh, you, you know, if even though Medicaid may not be the the highest amount of uh, reimbursement that you you normally would actually get, it's more than a average self pay. And and if majority of these patients that uh, that have access to a payer source such as Medicaid uh, are now unable to find another payer source, you know, the, the cost of that care, uh, although the, the reimbursement may not be enough to cover it under Medicaid, it is better than nothing, uh, we'll end up having to essentially uh, take the cost of that care and try to find another way from an efficiency standpoint or whatever else to uh, continue operating the way that we are. And, and uh, you know, so that is my main concern. You know, as far as your your second part of your question on whether or not, you know, when did it first uh, kind of get on a radar? Well, the first time it got on a radar is when they announced that, <laughs> you know, they're, they're going to end up, uh, you know, going through the redetermination. And in in the state of Georgia, it was, it was really uh, having folks requalify uh, in, in, in that process. Uh, now, I'll tell you, I have not seen a, a, a big shift in our Payer mix yet, but I, I think that there they'll, we'll have a, a couple of 100, 200 basis points potential impact from Medicaid to another source, and it'll probably be self-pay or uh, you know some sort of uncompensated uh, type of payer source. Right. Thank you, John. And Carrie, to you, what what kind of concerns are you hearing about redetermination from your members? Well, thank you for having me. First of all, the the overarching concern um, is really one of unknowns. You know, this is something that we've never done before. None of the states have ever done before. And so, you know, we've been finding as we go through the process that um, little things keep popping up that just no one has accounted for yet. And, you know, going back to the question that you just asked John about, you know, when it really got on his radar, from a policy standpoint, we've all been sort of looking out for this and, and watching it. We knew it was coming, but it really hit everybody when they started putting out estimates in terms of the number of folks that we were talking about. Um, and when those estimates came out earlier this year, um, it, it really piqued everybody's interest. And I think we started paying a lot more attention. Yeah, I have to admit that's exactly what I started to think about it. I, I had not quite realized how much it had grown. And when the first numbers came out, that was, you know, that certainly put it on, on my radar and, and immediately started hearing from some of some uh, providers that I'm talking to across the country. Um, okay, so we're going to, uh, start a polling question here. So let me turn it over to Jamie and then and then we're going to, to move on to the remainder of the discussion. The first polling question is, how does your hospital track and manage the impact of Medicaid redetermination on your various reimbursement or revenue streams? Your answer options are A, we're tracking monthly, B, we've looked at it a couple times, C, we're planning to look at it, or D, not sure. We'll give you a few moments to respond. 
to respond, please click the answer that you choose and hit submit. If you can't see the submit button, please enlarge the slide viewing area. You do have the option to submit questions for the presenters in your Q&A window. Um, as Eric said, we have quite a bit of content to cover today. So if we don't have time to respond during the webcast, we will definitely follow up with you afterwards. We'll give it a few more seconds to get answers in. I think we need the Jeopardy music, uh, Jamie, for future. Uh... All right, here are your results. Okay, that's, that is pretty much along the lines of what I would have expected at this point. I mean, there's certainly folks who've been getting or, or looking at all the attention that's coming through in the media and starting to ask these questions. Uh, but the question really is, you know, how, you know, how, how do you start to manage this? So let me, let me go to Carrie. I mean, the, there has been some interesting articles in the national media on Medicaid redeterminations and some of them have been rather catastrophic. So well, let me ask this, how, how is the media doing at communicating this issue? Is, uh, are they getting it right? You know, I, I think they're getting it right in terms of, you know, the, the numbers themselves that, you know, at least have been made public and making sure that everybody truly understands what's going on. Some of what's bothered me a little bit about the media coverage so far is that a, a lot of it's been really critical of the states. And, you know, I can speak from my own conversations with um, the, our Medicaid agency here in Georgia. Um, people are trying really hard <laughs> to get this right. And, you know, I said before, it's never been done before. Um, and some of the media portrayals have, I think, made it seem like the states are being a little bit callous in terms of how they're going about the process. And I just don't I don't really think that that's the case. Um, I think they are working really hard to try to make sure that, that everybody gets a fair redetermination, um, but it's a difficult population to track um, and you know they're, they're doing their best. It's important for people to see the numbers because they're big um, and I think it helps for the, um, the patient advocacy organizations in particular to get them mobilized and make sure that the beneficiaries understand. Um, but we can be nice about it. <laughs> okay. Um, I just wanted to put up a, a slide that there was definitely a process communicated to, by CMS to the states of how this process was ultimately supposed to work. I, I attended a couple of different conferences where CMS came out and spoke and said that they They've been thinking about this for a long time and they put a lot of, of effort into it. Um, so I, it probably was a, a little bit of a surprise to, to some when, when some of the stories started to come out about the problems. How, um, how, how is it going in Georgia specifically from your perspective? Um, we've, had some fits and, we've had some fits and starts. Um, you know, like all of the states, Georgia put a plan together and submitted oh. it to CMS. Um, we have opted to uh, kind of front load the redeterminations um, with the, the beneficiaries who are the most likely to no longer be eligible. So we have an expanded Medicaid in Georgia. So the easy example for that is, is um, somebody who got a Medicaid during the public health emergency because they were pregnant. And so, you know, at the time it was six months, we've expanded it to a year, but once that um, draws to a close, then they're no longer eligible. So I looked it up this morning. We've still, um, we don't have our September numbers yet, but through August, we have um, disenrolled a little over 250,000 Medicaid beneficiaries. Um, and that's a, a big number. Our hope is that, um, the monthly numbers will go down as we continue the process because we have front loaded it um, with the folks that we, we thought were no longer gonna be eligible. 
Um, but just like all of the states, we've had some some hiccups along the way. Um, we um, discovered that last month that some of our families were getting disenrolled erroneously. Um, if one member of the family was no longer um, determined eligible, then the software was automatically disenrolling all of the families. And that didn't just happen in Georgia, that happened a number of places. Um, and it's one of those things like that, you know, unintended consequences. And so we've paused everything um, in order to get that fixed and are making sure that um, it was mostly kids, unfortunately, that all of those kids are re-enrolled. Um, the other thing is that, you know, the state has been, as we've been going through this, trying to work with the provider community to figure out how we can help each other through this process. Um, and just yesterday, um, I got a, a call from our state Medicaid director saying that they had been working on it and finally figured out how to give um, hospitals um, a data file that has all of their Medicaid beneficiaries that have been seen at that hospital over the last two years. Um, and so we're, we just sent that out um, to our members today and we're hoping that that's gonna help at least continue to get the word out about this. Yeah, I, I, that's great. And in fact, that was my next question, which was to John is what, what kind of information are you actually getting uh, right now and how are you navigating your hospital through this? Yeah, no, hey, that, that's good news <laughs> uh, for me for <laughs> this coming from, from the state. Uh, you know, there, there hadn't been, I, I'd say a, a whole lot of uh, standard things coming through. You know, we've, the, the information that we've been working through is really at, at kind of our, our, our normal uh, patient uh, patient process, uh, you know, as, as patients come in and, uh, you know, we're trying to verify benefits and, and things like that. that that's usually our, our first point of contact and really our source of truth. And, and then if there ends up being some sort of issue with someone that may have had uh, eligibility in the past and now they, they didn't know that they're not eligible again. I mean, we'll try to go through the whole, uh, you know, verification process or get them re-enrolled or, or whatever else, which is always a, a challenge uh, uh, anyway with, with getting folks in, into most Medicaid programs uh, in, in the different states I've worked with. So, uh, yeah, it, it's it's really, uh, from from, stand, from my standpoint, we've, it, it's, when when the patients come in and uh, you know we're verifying benefits, and if if they're not enrolled and we think that they meet criteria and they they don't have a payer source, we we're trying to get them find them one, whether it be Medicaid or, or any other source. Yeah, I'll stay with you, John, because and, and you bring up a, an interesting topic that the uh, process of getting folks re-enrolled into. Medicaid or or into another, some type of other coverage uh, is happening at a time when the volumes of doing something like that are, are probably a lot higher. Um, are you are you seeing any bottlenecking or slowing down in the process that your your team's working through? I you know there ain't been anything that's been brought you know brought forth that's bubbled up that that is greater than than any other source. Uh, you know and now, now we're coming up on you know, the end of the year and the beginning of the new year with uh, new enrollment periods, uh, particularly with, uh, you know, anyone that may be trying to get into an exchange program and, uh, you know, access to, to something something like that. But, uh, you know, we do expend a fair amount of resources trying to get patients qualified for, for Medicaid. And, you know, it's, you know, we, we track them each month and, you know, and trying to get cooperation sometimes, whether it be from the patient or coordinating uh, with, with the state, uh, with third-party vendors and, and everything else uh, is is always a constant challenge. Uh, but there hasn't been anything that's been new, I, I, I'd say that's, that's out of the ordinary just recently. Thank you. Carrie, are you hearing anything along those lines that, that might be a, a canary in the coal mine as far as concerns about resources here? Yeah, well, you know, the, 
The big thing is, is the number of terminations that are due to procedural reasons. So, you know, I said earlier that we have a little over 250,000 through the end of August. Um, the vast majority of those, like over 215,000 of those are procedural terminations, meaning that um, they didn't hear back from the enrollee um, with the proper paperwork to verify. Um, and most of the time that seems to be due because to the fact that we couldn't find that person. Um, we don't have their up-to-date contact information. And so the, the hope is, is that as we continue through this process, it gets more and more um, you know, out there into the community that this is going on and how important it is for those members to have their contact information up to date um, that we'll start to see those procedural terminations go down some, but, but that's where potentially it adds to the workload of the hospitals and the providers too, right? Because hospitals are often, you know, helping those members, as John just talked about, get enrolled, whether it's for the first time or, you know, re-enrolled if they've been knocked off. So um, that's the thing that we're keeping our eye on. Excellent. Um, wanted to talk about some of the numbers and and, and kind of iterate on the fact that that each state is very different in this process. So a disenrollment rate in Texas is 69% versus 14%. So as we as we think about the stories that are in the media and and the concerns everybody every state's facing different problems here. Um, and so it's important that we we make sure that when we talk about this we we keep the lens on that there is a a overall problem and I think it, it seems to me uh, that some of the problems that we're hearing today are necessarily global in nature. The the inability of, of being able to um, communicate uh, effectively with the enrollees and make sure that they're they're um, getting re-enrolled if they need to, or recognizing that they they probably don't qualify necessarily and might need to jump into other plans. Um, but there are specifically state issues that still need to be addressed in a lot of these areas. Do I do I have that right, Carrie? Yeah, I think so. And you know, it's sort of a joke at this point, you know, you've seen one state Medicaid program, you've seen one state Medicaid program. Um, <laughs> and and it's the same with this redetermination <laughs> process. You know, in in here in Georgia, um, we have a, a separate state agency that's responsible for the actual enrollment determinations um, that than we do for the claims payment side of it. And so, you know, we've been working through all of those things about um, at, at the start of this process, um, our Medicaid managed care plans um, or the providers couldn't go into that enrollment system and update the contact information. We've worked through that now, but those are the types of things that on a state by state basis, each state is having to do differently because their uh, enrollment systems are all so different. Yeah. Uh, and I, you, you referred to it a little bit earlier, but you know, there was a CMS paused this process um, nationally and, and started to work with states to, to address some of the concerns that being communicated to the media uh, here's um, some of those on the slide uh, here. Carrie, has the process from from the perspective of the hospital association, has it improved um, at all? Have you seen much of a change? Are there any other concerns as it relates to these new requirements? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that we're gonna know the answer to that question until we see our September numbers, um, okay. which should be, it could be later this week. Um, they usually come out the week after or the first week of the month. So um, we're on the lookout for that. And I think that's what's really gonna tell us. Um, the other thing is, is that Georgia and some other states have um, received some waivers from CMS um, to help them streamline uh, the redetermination process a little bit. And so um, one of the things that we've just started up is uh, being able to use the, the TANF um, enrollment information to to verify eligibility. Um, and there's a few other things in the waiver category like that that I think are gonna make it um, easier on the state um, 
for the, the sort of mass of redeterminations, but then that frees up other people to help with the other issues in terms of um, the folks that are getting procedurally terminated. So uh, it kind of helps on both ends of the spectrum if we can get it streamlined. Excellent. Okay, well, let's, let's take a, a quick uh, polling break. Jamie, what's our next polling question? This is the second polling question. Is your hospital performing regular Medicaid eligibility verification to track monthly or quarterly DISH and 340B qualification thresholds? Your answer options are A, yes, we are performing verifications at least quarterly. B, we don't qualify for DISH or 340B. C, we aren't performing regular verifications. Or D, not sure. As a reminder, if you would like to receive CPE credit for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions. Please make sure that you are selecting your answer choice within the slides window and not adding it to the Q&A window. We'll give it about 10 more seconds to get your answers in. And here are your results. Okay, that's again kind of along the lines of what I'm hearing out in the public. So that's that follows. Um, so we've talked about some of the the numbers shifting along, but what uh, John had indicated earlier was he's not really seeing much of a change so far. Rich, let, let's get you into the discussion a little bit more. Why, why isn't he? Why, why are we not seeing more impact right now uh, at so many of the providers? Yeah, thanks. So I think it's a couple of things. Um, there's definitely going to be a lag in this from you know a revenue and revenue cycle perspective, where um, you know first of all, just the um, the redetermination process is going to be you know it's going to take over a year to complete this process, right? So. Um, you know, so we're still kind of in the, the middle stages of that. Um, and then a lot of these folks aren't immediately uh, looking to receive um, care. And so there's gonna be a delay associated with that as well. And I think, you know, they're, one of the things, you know, we don't wanna see from a, from a care perspective of the population is we don't wanna see folks who are delaying needed care, uh, but we know that is one of the things that can happen when people lose Medicaid coverage. Um, and so that's one of the, the, the outcomes we like to avoid for our populations. Um, and I think that's contributing to the delay in, in the impact here as well. And, you know, one of the things just I would note kind of on this slide that's really, really important, I think, and kind of unexpected to me is looking at that, that middle bullet around the 15 million um, that are expected to be, um, you know, potentially disenrolled through this process. And about half of those who would still qualify for coverage. And that's really, really important point here um, that there are, you know, that's, that's what we want to avoid is that half or so that are still going to be eligible for coverage. Um, but then, you know, there is the other half or so um, that is likely to not be eligible for coverage. And, you know, the goal would be to help them find some other coverage somewhere. It, John, knowing that there is this potential impact coming down the road, when, you're, when your uh, peers give you a call and say, how, how, are you, how are you budgeting for this? How are you forecasting for this? What, what, what's your answer? I don't know what my answer would be. I mean, it's... <laughs> well, I, if if there's not a, uh, like with probably most of my counterparts, you know, if you don't have a, a true definite, I mean, you have to reserve for it. I mean, it, it, if, if the patients are receiving care and you have a, a type of payer source right now, uh, you know, your, your basic logic is that a year from now, they're on average, they're still gonna need some sort of care and you're gonna provide it, especially if they come through the ER and uh, you just may not have a payer source or a greatly reduced payer source uh, paying amount. I mean, that, there's, there's, it, it, to me, it's a fairly simple formula. It's not a very good answer. It's not the one that, that, that I want, but you know, that's, that's the facts on it. And you know, how, and, and I, and I agree with, with you know, the discussion earlier, I, if, as 
in Georgia and in general, as more and more are getting off the Medicaid rolls, you know, there's a lag of impact. And, uh, you, you know, it, it may be six months or nine months from now when we're really seeing the true impact on this. Uh, and, that, and that's probably more the reason why I'm not, I, I haven't seen that, that impact yet. I know it's coming. And, uh, you know, and, and as much as that we can end up trying to mitigate that uh, reduction, maybe, maybe the, the, the ability of us cutting that in half, if half can truly be re-enrolled back in, uh, probably investing in some additional resources to try to get information for folks that have been, uh, you know, have not met the redetermination of qualifications yet to, to work with them to get them eligible again for, for at least another time period. Uh, for us, that would probably be money well spent. Yep, yep, agreed. Yep. Uh, Rich, Rich I'll, I'll, similar question to you. Providers calling you asking, how how should I forecast for this? What what, what kind of tools or message do you, do you convey? Yeah, so, um, you know, there's no, no question we're in unprecedented times, right? We keep saying that, and, and this is another case where there's no path forward, you know, that we've all kind of been through before for something like this. I think, you know, the conversations I've been having are, you know, we can go back and look at history, right? So we can look at 2019, we can look at, you know, maybe the first two months of 2020 before the, the pandemic really started impacting our payer mix. Um, and then we can also look at state level um, information about kind of what we're expecting for redetermination impacts and things at the state level. You know, of course it will impact local hospitals differently. And, you know, so anything we do is gonna be rough and, you know, we've got to compare that to kind of what we're seeing on the ground. Um, but I think those are the, the best data points that we can get. Carrie, what, what is the Hospital Association telling providers as far as what they should be looking at and, and how they should be, what kind of metrics are out there to kind of forecast this coming, going forward? Um, well, you know, I, I don't have a, a crystal ball in that area, and I don't think we've, we've uh, certainly don't have a formula that we've sent out to folks to use. That would be nice. Um, <laughs> you know, we, did, uh, we did just recently um, send out um, a note to all of our 340B hospitals in particular, um, you know, going to your previous polling question. Um, to really make sure that they are tracking um, their numbers from a dish perspective, because we're starting to get more concerned that that's going to have um, a longer term impact on folks um, because of all of this. And, and it goes to um, what we've been trying to convey to, to both state and federal policymakers really um, about a lot of these issues, and that's the, you know, the public health emergency may be over, but the impact of the public health emergency is not over. Um, and there are a lot of things going on right now in healthcare impacting the provider community, um, stemming, you know, from those, those three years, and um, we're not done dealing with it yet. What's, what, Will the hospital association be hoping the providers can communicate to policymakers in the upcoming year as it relates to this and other issues with the this transition? Um, well, we're we're asking folks to um, be tracking their financials, be tracking their uninsured rates, um, and the amount they're spending on that care. Because you know, as we saw last year, um, you know, the the finances for the hospitals were just terrible in 2022. I mean, I don't, um, it's been a while since we've had a year that bad. And when, what we found was when hospitals were able to take their own numbers um, to their uh, delegation, whether it's, it was at the state or federal level, it's the individual hospital numbers that really get an impact um, with your legislators. And, you know, we can do statewide numbers um, and they look big and they are big, um, but when it's your home hospital um, and they can see how much you're struggling um, and how it impacts 
uh, your community, then then that really has um, has a bigger impact, I think, than than what we do at the state level. The other thing I'll add is that um, we've been trying to get folks to match up um, the amounts, for example, that if they have an increase in their uncompensated care, um, match that up to a, another community benefit that you're providing so that it hits home a little bit clearer that you know we're not just moving numbers around here. This is this amount is the equivalent that we normally spend on our you know our our farmers market that we do once a month um, or something along those lines, so they can see the impact of the, to the community. That's fantastic. Thank you. Let's let's squeeze in uh, our third polling question, Jamie. The third polling question is, are you working to identify and implement strategies to support financial sustainability and work towards mitigating negative impacts of Medicaid redeterminations? The answer options are A, yes, we have a strategy in place. B, we would like to put mitigation in place but don't have the resources. C, no, we do not plan to deploy mitigation. Or D, not sure. For those of you that would like a copy of today's slides, you can download them from the folder that says slide deck and handouts. We will also be sending the slides via email tomorrow along with a recording of the webcast. There's still some answers coming in, so we'll give it a few more seconds. All right, here are your results. It, it seems that our, our breakdowns are very similar on every one of these questions with 50% being not sure, uh, which I, I would expect. This is one of those issues where, where we wanna make sure that hospitals are uh, aware of it given some of the work that we're doing with our clients and at the same time know that without more information, it's really hard to to do much, so I, I certainly understand uh, that. Let's let's talk a little bit about um, what ultimately can be done. And, and Rich, I'm gonna I'm gonna get you back in here because we we talked a little bit earlier about um, some of the resource concerns as everybody's uh, dealing with higher volumes that need to be moved through the eligibility process. Uh, all at the same time, and all of the other uh, needs that are going on, at, both at the hospital's rev cycle uh, departments as they're trying to collect cash and, and do all the things that they normally do with this added thing, and at the at the state level, like what what should hospitals be doing right now to help get ready for this? Yeah, thanks, Eric. And um, you know, the first thing I'd say is um, you know, just stepping back for a second, you know, I know we've got folks on the call here today who are not representing hospitals or representing medical groups and other providers. And really a lot of this, including this information here, I think applies to all providers. Um, you know, the, we're, we're all dealing with the same kinds of issues here. Um, yeah, and so, you. you know, first of all, just thinking about resources and, um, you know, provider resources generally are stretched so thin right now. And revenue cycle is certainly no exception to that. And you know, compound that with the fact that we've not really had to do a, a lot of this Medicaid eligibility uh, for the last three years or so, um, and the fact you know this is really going to be a big challenge and a big lift for a lot of providers. Um, and you know, it's been great today. You know, with some of the news we got from Carrie about what you know what the you know state of Georgia has been able to do in terms of getting information out to providers, um, and I know some other states are doing similar things. Um, so, you know, what we're really encouraging all providers to do is to be proactive and, you know, work with the state, work with your hospital association, with your medical associations. Um, and so you can be proactive and identify your patients um, ahead of time so that they can, um, you know, maintain eligibility um, or find other coverage where that's uh, relevant here. Um, you know, again, we don't want them showing up without coverage and we don't want them delaying care. Um, and so, uh, you know, so those are a lot of the strategies that we're encouraging folks to, uh, to deploy, and we're seeing, you know, being used successfully here as well. Um, you know, thinking about some of the policies and things, you know, you know, one of the, you know, less glamorous areas of, of healthcare is maybe 
the revenue cycle scripts. Um, and yet, you know, I think that's pretty important here because you know you think about kind of the communication we're having with our patients and um, you know, we need to be talking to them about, you know, have you received a letter from your Medicaid agency about redetermination? Um, you know, have, are you eligible for other coverage? Are, have you become recently employed? And so maybe that's why you're no longer eligible for Medicaid, but you do have coverage available through, um, through an employer or something like that. Um, you know, so changing those scripts, I think is really, really critically important here. Um, and that's going to yield a lot of benefit down the road for, again, for both providers and for the patients. Um, and then just taking another look at financial assistance, charity care policies, and you know, bad debt, um, and then just patient intake overall to make sure that we've got the right kind of space in this process to deal with this. And um, you know, thinking about patient intake generally and the state process, one of the things that we're seeing in some cases here also is some of these states are um, you know, going through the redetermination process in a certain rhythm. So they're, um, they're applying redetermination effective, either, like say the first of the month and the 15th of the month or every Monday or something like that. And so, you know, when you're thinking about eligibility and things, you're able to actually incorporate that rhythm into your eligibility checks that you're doing as a provider. Um, you know, so for example, if, if, they're, if, if they're having the redetermin redeterminations effective every Monday, for example, you're able to take say on Tuesday and actually do the checks for the whole, you know, for the next week. Uh, and, and, and know that that's going to be fairly safe. So those are the kinds of things that I think are really helpful. And you know, again, coordination with the state, coordination with all, all of your other providers in the state is going to be really helpful. Carrie, as, as we hear about that, I'm thinking about the state side here. Are, are you hearing in Georgia or in other states innovative ways the states are taking to try to address this, this issue as you know, now that they're got their feet under them? Yeah, so, you know, where I know that this, the state Medicaid agencies are all talking to each other and, you know, we at the association are all talking to each other, too, to, to try to, to answer that exact question. Um, the, the most innovative thing I've heard so far comes out of Massachusetts, where um, they've been able to use some of their leftover ARPA dollars um, to contract with an organization um, that is is going around the community and actually knocking on doors I and mean, they're canvassing um, in the the communities where they know there are uh, heavy Medicaid populations and just you know with a clipboard asking um, if they've gotten a letter or if they confirming that their contact info is up to date. Um, we have had some discussions here in Georgia about. Um, how do we could use some of our ARPA dollars, but nothing of it's really come to fruition yet. But certainly if you think you have a good idea, I wouldn't hesitate to reach out to your state Medicaid agency and just ask them about it. I mean, the way that we, the way that we ended up getting the redetermination files with the dates for the hospitals um, is just because we asked and they said, oh, well, we don't know if we can do that. And they went back and looked and um, it, it took a little work on their part, but um, they made it happen. So don't be afraid to, to reach out and ask the questions. Yeah, it's kind of a, a, a odd question for me um, related to the health plans. And I'll, I'll start with you, John, are you hearing anything from your Medicaid health plans that, you know, were there getting involved in this process to try to help um, address eligibility? I haven't heard anything so far from our managed Medicaid plans. Uh, you know, they're they're uh, they're, they're growing in, uh, in in size in Georgia right now, but uh, pro probably our split between managed and uh, traditional Medicare uh, it's more it's still heavier on the traditional Medicare Med Medicaid side right now. Carrie, same question to you. Are you hearing anything either in Georgia or other states about health plans involvement in the eligibility process? Well, I, I do know that the state has reached out to them and, you know, has, you know, sort of voluntold them to um, help get the word out. Um, and most of the states, including Georgia, have pretty good resources available on their websites um, in terms of marketing materials are probably the wrong word, but, you know, branded pieces of information and even scripts that you can use um, to help ask the questions. In Georgia, we have a little googly-eyed peach um, that they put on all of the documents. And so even if, 
you know, providers or plans or whoever it is and don't do anything else, if they can print off a couple of those flyers and put them at their intake desks um, just so that people see it, then I think that that every little bit helps at this point. Let's let's squeeze in the final polling question and then if we have a little bit of time, we can take some Q&A. Jamie? The final polling question is, what actions have you taken to be proactive in seeking out at-risk enrollees and assisting them with reapplying for Medicaid benefits? The answer options are A, our existing Medicaid enrollment vendor is supporting it, or we have hired a vendor to support this work. B, we're working with our state Medicaid agency and or hospital association. C, we intend to be proactive about assisting beneficiaries, but we haven't started yet. Or D, we think our existing processes are sufficient. Once you've completed all CPE requirements, you will be able to download a PDF of your certificate from the CPE progress window. Also, at the end of the webcast, the survey link will appear. We'd appreciate any feedback you're willing to share and we'll use the information to develop future webcasts for you. Still some answers coming in. We'll give it about 10 more seconds. While people are, are doing that, I, I read something in the q and I, I wanted to post out there because we were just talking about innovative uh, ideas and someone just posted that they posted a massive food drive uh, over the summer with thousands showing up and, and they had uh, clipboards and iPads ready to offer assistance to ensure that uh, they were updating Medicaid participants information. I think that is just really a, a smart approach uh, to take and, and hopefully uh, other states are thinking about innovative ways like that. That's, I thanks for that. sharing that, yeah. Okay, here yeah, are your results. One, one, of the challenges, one of the challenges that I, I've had in other spots on, on, on eligibility, getting folks uh, eligible is one, having an educated staff or whatever that is helping to assist it takes a little bit of time because not all the Medicaid programs and uh, from state to state are straightforward and and you know just having the the ability to answer some simple questions there person to person because uh, you know if, if you do get that person there right in front of you you know that's when you're going to get the most effective <laughs> enrollment and probably buy-in than than trying to do anything remotely so you know if if we, yeah, I think the food drive's great, and if uh, you know, if we if we do have uh, enough folks that can answer the questions right there to help assist move things along with the eligibility process, uh, the success rate usually is much higher. That's great. Oh wow, that's quite a breakdown. So that's an equal. Uh, <laughs> that's an equal breakdown. Uh, oh, that's great. Okay, so 30% believe the existing process is sufficient and it sounds like there's quite a bit of work happening, but you would expect that every every community is different, every every state's different. So I guess I shouldn't be surprised at all by that, that response. Let me, let me do one of the questions really quick because I know we don't have a lot of time, but it, it's a really good one. Um, uh, read it off. Well, we have a clinical and ethical obligation not to abandon patients. We also can't afford to deliver free care month after month. Most of those who lost coverage don't qualify for marketplace and can't afford self-pay. Any advice on how to handle this dilemma? I'll, link, I'll get that to John. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> and we, we, we always continue to try to figure that one out. It It, it is a balance. Um, you know, in, in 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 some some larger communities where they may have a a true public uh, safety net hospital, there there are all, all, obviously some some pro programs that they have that that will offer those kind of uh, care at uh, maybe at a reduced price. Uh, you know, in uh, South Georgia, uh, we we actually do have uh, uh, kind of a. a, a a, a clinic that we that we help support is not run by us, but 
uh, it, it basically provides access to care for the patient population that may be in the gap that that really is uh, that they, they make too much to qualify for Medicaid, but uh, their employer or whatever may not uh, offer insurance, but they, they need that care. Uh, so, you know, you know, trying to support some uh, some community based programs that uh, that will offer some sort of basic primary care that, uh, you know, it, it's a beneficiary to us because if if programs like this are not out there, then they're going to come see us. Uh, mm -hmm. So it really helps uh, helps helps me out, you know, financially, but also operationally out of our ER because uh, our, our ERs usually are, are pretty pretty crowded, and uh, it it ends up having a really trickle down effect on that. So I, I would say any kind of community based program that uh, that that will provide you know you know maybe some dental care or uh, some sort of basic primary care even if it's at a reduced cost or, or, or you know, there, there's, there's different models out there that, that work, but that's, that's the way that I end up seeing it from a, from a provider standpoint, because the way I see it is we're, we've got the ER that's open and, and, and folks are going to come see us. So really, how do we end up providing a, a better setting of care, a lower cost setting of care, but still have good results coming out of that? It is the, the question of the day, for sure. Thank you, John. That, that was perfect. I, I couldn't have done that better. Um, but we have hit our time. Uh, I appreciate it. I just really want to thank John and Carrie again for, for joining us today and giving us the insight, uh, specifically in Georgia, but but in a way that, that we can extrapolate to the other states as well uh, about this issue. So thank you again. Uh, I'm going to turn this back over to Jamie. If you do have questions that we didn't uh, we weren't able to answer them. Uh, we will uh, address them after the call. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, Richard, Carrie, and John for a great discussion today. I also want to thank the audience for being engaged and submitting your questions to help guide today's conversation. If we didn't have time to answer yours, we'll follow up with you after the webcast. Also, feel free to reach out to our presenters if you have additional questions. Their contact information is in your console. There are a number of additional resources in the upper right-hand corner of your user console. This may be of interest to the audience, so definitely check that out. If you met all CPE requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPS progress window. A copy will also be emailed within two weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. As a reminder, if you attended today's pre presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in your console. Last but not least, finally, here is a link to an online survey for today's presentation. Thank you for joining our webcast. We hope you'll join us again next time.